Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, to our panelists and our audience members. Um, I'm John Field. I'm the Executive Secretary of the Pacific Salmon Commission. I know many of you are part of the PSC family and are here participating online uh, for the last couple of days and for another couple more days uh, for our annual meeting. I also know that many of you are joining us from the public, uh, from the tribes and First Nations on both sides of the border. And we do really appreciate the fact that you've shown interest in, in uh, joining our session today. Uh, this is one of four special events this week. Uh, there'll be two this evening. Um, two of them this evening. One is the presentation of our Larry Rudder Memorial Award. Uh, and then that'll be followed by a summary of the Basin Events to Coastal Impacts projects starting at 4 p.m. Pacific time. In addition, the fourth session will be a presentation on the Forecast R application. Uh, that'll be made by Antonio Velez Espino. Um, that's at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow. And links to all of these events are available online via the psc.org website. If you click on the members portal uh, in the upper right corner of our homepage, you'll be able to get all of the links you need for those sessions. But turning our attention uh, to why everyone's here right now, uh, this morning's event will summarize the methodology, the findings, and frankly, the importance of a recent PSC special report that was titled The Sociocultural Significance of Salmon for Tribes and First Nations. <clears throat> this report was made possible through funding from the PSC Southern Endowment Fund uh, and is available on our website, psc.org, under the publications page. So anyone can download that. Um, and I I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, I, I certainly did in, in reading through it. Uh, we have a number of panelists joining us today. I'll go through their names and introduce them. Uh, first, we have Maya Kosian, the Executive Director of Earth Economics in Tacoma, Washington. We have Ron Allen, Chairman of Jamestown Slalom Tribe uh, and a US Commissioner to the PSC. We also are joined by Chief Russ Jones from the Haida Nation and uh, also serving as a Canadian Commissioner to the PSC. Marie Ned from the Sumas First Nation and also serving alongside Russ as a Canadian uh, PSC commissioner. And finally, McCoy Oatman from the Nez Perce tribe, um, also serving as a United States commissioner to the PSC. Um, my friends, the research you'll hear about today is really the first of its kind in the PSC arena and really does illuminate a large component of the salmon culture in our region that really can't be measured in dollars and cents. Um, before I turn things over to Ron Allen to get us started, I'll give you some housekeeping things um, to keep in mind. Today's session is being recorded uh, for those who cannot attend or those who would like to go back and see some of the highlights after we're done. And the Secretariat of my office will provide details on how to access that recording after the session ends. For the audience members, the attendees, uh, you're muted during the remarks like right now and during the presentation but we have budgeted time for questions at the end. You can enter your question via the Q&A button. That's in sort of the bottom middle of your Zoom screen there. If you move your cursor around, you'll see it. Um, and you can click the like, like button next to questions that you support or that you wanted to ask yourself. Um, the sort of upvote questions that are coming in through the Q&A button. But if you don't want to type your question, you can simply raise your hand. That's another button uh, in the, the lower part of your screen. And I'll keep, keep an eye on that for hands that are raised and we'll, we'll unmute you and you can just speak your question uh, directly. Um, with that, uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists to present the report and I'll turn it over to Ron Allen to get us started. Thanks, Ron. Well, thanks, John, um, and welcome everybody. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how I uh, drew the the, the straw to lead this conversation off, but I think I was absent in the meeting that Russ and Nor Murray uh, and McCoy were at, and they appointed me. So I'll kick it off, but they'll they'll provide uh, better clarity about um, uh, this report um, um, with regard to the importance and the value, uh, the cultural and spiritual value of salmon to our our uh, tribes and First Nations and our and our respective communities. Uh, uh, I do want to, uh, first of all, give a shout out to uh, Maya um, and uh, the Earth Economics uh, um, uh, team who did all the work in terms of collaborating with all of our tribal leaders, 
our elders, our, our spiritual leaders, uh, our communities uh, who gathered the, um, the various uh, perspectives, why salmon is so important to indigenous people uh, in, the, in the Northwest. And um, uh, I, I personally feel this is a very good report. It came out of uh, the effort uh, a couple years back, I think it might've been three years ago, John can correct me about that one. Uh, when we, uh, uh, in the US uh, Canada Forum, decided we needed to quantify the value of salmon to the Northwest um, economy and communities. And so uh, out of that report, we analyzed uh, the, its value to all the fishers, uh, from Alaska south all the way up the, the Columbia River uh, to Idaho. And, uh, and they did that analysis uh, based on not just the fishers, but also the, the tertiary industry that surrounded it. They uh, did their best back then uh, to incorporate uh, indigenous values and they had a chapter for it. Um, Russ and uh, Murray and I and, and uh, uh, McCoy and our, our tribal leadership and those that we we're responsible to basically said that wasn't good enough. Uh, that didn't really capture the essence of the value um, uh, and the importance of salmon to our people, our cultural way of life and, and spiritual way of life. That sometimes people just don't know how to quantify and we argue that you can't quantify it. So it's not a monetary value. Um, it's, it's a way of life value. So um, uh, we, we uh, uh, ask the commission uh, to uh, to sponsor this. I think we got the money from the from one of the funds. I can't remember John and and uh, uh, and uh, basically tracked down Amaya's um, uh, program, um, who was delighted to be able to take on this charge. So she worked with uh, Murray, Russ, me, and McCoy, and uh, uh, and then then we reached out to our leadership. Now I will say this. Uh, you know, with uh, well over 200 First Nations in British Columbia and, and uh, you know, uh, and countless uh, uh, tribes in Alaska and, and, and uh, the 45 or so tribes in the, in the lower 48, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, particularly, um, it was challenging to figure out how we could pick and choose. Um, and we did the best we could, but we think that this report does do a good job of capturing um, those values and those perspectives. and. Um, so I look forward to, to uh, working our way through that report. So with that, I'm going to turn it over without you know, like opening remarks. I'll turn it over to Murray or Russ. I don't know who's going to step in after me to uh, uh, introduce this, this uh, presentation. Yep. Good morning, everyone. And um, good to see everybody. And thanks, Ron, for being just a little bit late once in a while, because then it gives us the power to get to delegate you first <laughs> to making the comments, but thank you for your comments. Appreciate them. Yeah, I'd just like to start uh, by acknowledging the commission for allowing time on this week's agenda to share this important report with the, with the PSC family. So I was asked to provide some comments on behalf of the First Nations Caucus. And what I wanna do is share a little bit about myself and uh, the community that I come from in a way that is uh, somewhat reflective of First Nations, their culture and relation, relationship to fish and fisheries. So I'm one of the uh, First Nations uh, commissioners and I've had the pleasure of uh, serving on the commission and for Canada since uh, 2013. My English name is Murray Ned. My ancestral name is Colossitan, which I share with my two boys. And uh, that name has been passed down from generation to generation. And, Eventually it will be passed to another member of my family in the future. Um, my home, home village is Sumas First Nation located about uh, 100 kilometers east of Vancouver and it's in the middle of the Fraser Valley. And our nation is uh, part of the Stalo, which is comprised of 24 First Nations in the lower Fraser River area. And Stalo in our Halkamilum language has two meanings. Uh, the first is people of the river, which essentially describes who we are and where we come from. And, the second is um, <clears throat> the river of all rivers, which is uh, commonly known as the Fraser River today. So the Stalo are people, Stalo people are also part of a larger collective of nations known as the Coast Salish Nation, which is comprised of approximately 54 nations and tribes in the Pacific Northwest. So we've had this relationship for quite some time. 
And even though this is a vast region that spans Washington and BC, our language laws and cultural protocols are similar in nature. And particularly when it comes to fish, fisheries and water. So a little bit more about myself and I'll probably uh, give up my age and uh, eldership here, but I started fishing when I was a teenager and that, that translates to a little over four decades now. So that time, and at that time we were licensed to fish three days per week for food, social and ceremonial uh, fisheries all year. <clears throat> so when you do the math, that's about 156 days per year. And it was a time when you could uh, leisure, leisurely practice the fishery, the fish were abundant and we had access to all five salmon species. And even more than that, we had access access to steelhead, sturgeon, and Olukin in the lower Fraser. So abundant years and lots of opportunity. And if you fast forward to our recent uh, FSC fishery in 2021, we had, I think we had six days in August uh, targeting Chinook. And then October, November, we targeted pinks and chum for approximately nine days. So that equates to 15 days for the year. Uh, we didn't have access to sockeye or coho, obviously due to uh, the conservation concerns that we um, experienced last year. So when I do a bit of a comparison, my teenage fisheries uh, four decades ago was 156 days annually to what I fished in uh, 2021 it was 15 days, which equates to about 10% of the opportunity I had, to, had as a teenager. So really today, I'm, I guess I'm 10% of what I was four decades ago in terms of the ability to secure food, practice the fishery, and maintain my cultural integrity and connection to the fish and water. So, you know, this has major consequences with the inability to transfer knowledge <clears throat> and fishery practices to my grandchildren and others within the community. Yeah, given that it has taken a period of about four decades to see this major decline in Fraser salmon, I have to think that it will likely take at least four decades to rebuild and recover what we can. So as a fisherman from the lower Fraser, I still have to consider myself fortunate as all Fraser salmon pass through our riverbanks and it's given us some opportunity for our communities today and last year. But you know, the same cannot be said for our mid and upper Fraser First Nations who have not had much access for several years and in some cases, not at all. Uh, similar, similarly, our marine and approach nations have had limited access and this is now occurring on Vancouver Island, the central coast, Northern and transboundary regions. So it's pretty imminent within all of uh, BC and the Yukon. So that's just a bit of a snapshot and a perspective into some of the experience from a lower Fraser lens. I'm certain there are other nations uh, would have more to add from their respective territories. And as Ron has mentioned, the sociocultural report we are sharing today begins to describe in more detail the historic and current day impacts and values. And it's a result of recognizing that tribes and nations didn't feel that there was enough time to effectively contribute to the commission's socioeconomic report in 2017. And lots of respect for that work for sure that happened. The 100 page report produced at that time was successfully utilized as a business case for the respective countries to secure resources for treaty implementation. Three pages were dedicated as Ron mentioned to descriptions of the importance of subsistence and food, social and ceremonial fisheries. So it was imperative that the nations and tribes took the time, dedicated more time and resources into the work and results you will see today. Um, one consideration to emphasize is that this is a qualifying report without much uh, quantification elements included in it. So there might be some more work to do on that. And Ron talked a little bit about the complexity of that. So this work is extremely complex for nations and tribes and there was a lot of uncertainty on how or if socio-cultural aspects could be quantified within the time frame and resources we had. Uh, the last item of note is that uh, time resources and COVID-19, the pandemic limited our ability to reach out beyond the First Nation caucus members. Ron shared this as, as well. So there are a number of nations who have not had an opportunity to contribute. So that's kind of it, but in closing, uh, on behalf of the First Nations caucus, I wanted to 
take the time to acknowledge the opportunity to collaborate with the tribes on this very important work. Um, it was an amazing challenge. Um, I think it was a, an amazing outcome and really reaffirmed how closely we're connected uh, by water, fish and our culture to John Field and his team that supported a lot of the coordination and behind the scenes. Thank you so much for that work, John. And the Southern Endowment Funds for resourcing and making this a reality. And of course, to Maya and Will and our Earth, Earth economic friends for their resilience and patience, figuring out a how, how to make this work in a good way for the nations and tribes. And I'm, I'm sure we challenged you a lot because it wasn't easy to do, but I want to thank you for that. And um, to the First Nations Fisheries Council, Jansen Wong and his team for their ongoing support of the First Nations Caucus, um, lots of work on, behind the scenes. And to the commission for providing the space and time for this work to happen. And of course, thank you to the PSC family for your participation and interest today. And that uh, brings my com uh, comments to a conclusion and HKCM. Thank you, Murray. Um, do any of the other panelists wish to speak before I turn it over to Maya for her presentation? Yeah, John, it's, um, maybe I'll add something. Singite La, Nangjingwas Hanadu Kiga. Yeah, my, my Hadi name is Nangjingwas, and good day, everyone. I'm really happy to see the participation today. Um, Sam and his, um, of critical importance to First Nations and tribes, uh, all, all stretching all the way from Alaska, you know, to Oregon. Um, I live in um, Skagil, the Skidigat in, in Haida Gwaii. Uh, I just wanted to say something about the uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty and the Pacific Salmon Commission. The treaty does recognize the, the importance of salmon, you know, to First Nations and tribes. And that's also reflected in the, the participation um, in, the, in the process, the PSC process. Um, I, I wanted to just say um, th thank, thank John also for um, so the support and the Southern Fund for, to do this work. Um, it, it's a challenge you know, to bring in um, you know, social and cultural um, aspects. And there's sensitivity around sharing that kind of information. And, and I think Earth Economics, you know, found a way, you know, to do that um, in, in a way that was supported, you know, by our First Nations Caucus and the uh, and the U.S. U.S. Tri tribal representatives as well. So again, um, uh, Hawa, thanks everyone. And if I might, uh, John, uh, uh, I want to do a shout out for uh, Gord Starrett. Uh, Gordon, uh, Gordy has been. Uh, a real driving force here to uh, work with Maya and her team and us uh, moving this project forward. So I would, I, I'd like to um, provide a little opportunity for Gordon to uh, uh, say a few remarks about this and, and this project, if you would, don't mind. Of course, uh, Gord, take it away. Thanks, Ron, and thanks, John, and everybody on the panel, and, and for everybody that's joined us this morning, I um, really appreciate it. Um, as Ron alluded earlier, um, it's it's an ex we th we feel that this is a really good report. It's a really good start um, to trying to capture the the essence of what salmon means to to indigenous peoples, um, and then so and, and that the broader community understands that as well. Because um, a lot of times it's you look at it and there's a lot of um, talk about I mean the harvest and whatnot. But it's it's part of our social fa fabric, and 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 languages are built around it, and so um, I just appreciate everybody um, joining us today. Um, I guess I should introduce myself a little bit. Um, my name is Gordon Starrett. I'm the executive director with the UFFCA, and in the Upper Fraser region, I'm chair of the First Nations Caucus, Canadian First Nations Caucus of the Pacific Salmon Commission. My hereditary name is Wo and um, from the Gitsan Nation in, uh, on the Skeena River and um, spent a lot of years working on the river and seeing a lot of changes as Murray has pointed out and it's gone from um, 
really good time to and families coming together to where it's been difficult to to achieve our section 35 um harvest rights and um so it's it, it it's interesting and um and this i think this report Cap captures the the essence of what it means to to, to indigenous peoples, uh, what salmon mean to indigenous peoples. So thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm here to provide support to the commissioners and try to answer any questions at the end if, um, if required. Thank you. Thank you, Gord. Um, if the other panelists are ready, I could turn the microphone over to Maya and she can uh, proceed with the presentation. All right, thank you, Ron, Murray, Russ, uh, Gord, and and John. Uh, this project would not be possible without you. And also, uh, McCoy Oatman. Also, like to thank uh, the First Nations and Tribal Caucus members. This project relied on meetings with them as a group and individuals. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, I'm assuming you're seeing the, the correct monitor with the, the title. Um, All right, thank you, Russ, for that thumbs up. <laughs> All right, so to begin with, um, Earth Economics uh, operates on lands of Coast Salish people, specifically the ancestral homelands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians. My name is Maya Kosian, uh, Executive Director of Earth Economics. Also with me today that's present uh, here is uh, Tina Ward and Will Golding, who are also co-authors of the report. And uh, Olivia Molden, who's the lead author and project lead of, of this project, she's on maternity leave. So that's why I'm presenting instead of, of her today. <clears throat> uh, but she, she sends her best to her wishes. So, Today I'm going to talk about uh, this kind of overview of the presentation, a uh, little bit about who Earth Economics is, uh, and then jump into the project objectives, a uh, little bit about the participation of this uh, project, how we developed the framework, jumping into the analysis after we've developed that framework, going over some of the findings, and then lastly, uh, going over key recommendations based on this, this project. And then we'll leave some time for uh, questions uh, at the end. <clears throat> so for those who are not familiar, Earth Economics is a nonprofit based in Tacoma, Washington. Our mission is to account for the benefits that nature provides through awareness raising, place-based analysis, and policy and finance recommendations. While we typically focus on uh, quantification of the monetary value of ecosystem services. There are many services, including cultural and spiritual values, that shouldn't have a monetary value. And so uh, we also look at the non-monetary value uh, that nature provides, and, uh, and that's tied to this project specifically. Uh, Overall, the goal of this project was to con uh, convey tri tribal and First Nations perspectives regarding the sociocultural significance of Pacific salmon. Uh, specifically, the aims were to provide the Pacific Salmon Commission with a foundation to understand relationships between Pacific salmon and indigenous societies, raise awareness among indigenous and non-indigenous communities about the significance of Pacific salmon harvests and Pacific salmon conservation, provide information to support future funding and decision-making through the Pacific Salmon Treaty. The project deliverables include a report and a fact sheet, uh, which John mentioned are available on the PSC publications website. Uh, it's also available on the Earth Economics website. Uh, we also have an interactive map, which I'll show at the end of the, the presentation. And if you want to dig into to the report more, uh, we welcome you to, to look into that. <clears throat> so to, to meet the objectives, the project relied on participation based around the tribal and First Nation caucuses. This is why the report is structured around quotes and insights from participants. 
uh, throughout the project, 137 individuals contacted were contacted from 60 tribes and First Nations, 35 participants interviewed, uh, 66 invited to participate. Uh, there were uh, six uh, meetings with relevant experts, 82 survey responses, um, feedback sessions, workshops, uh, and I, you know, it was a pleasure to work with with the advisor advisor group as well. Um, and we had 20 meetings and webinars that uh, we attended. Uh, and I, I know I mentioned this before, but truly this project wouldn't be possible without the involvement of the tribal and First Nations uh, caucuses. So we focused our analysis around uh, the, the interviews. So we transcribed the interviews. Most of our participants were men in later or mid-career. We talked with more uh, participants from Canada and from uh, First Nations than from the US and tribes. Uh, the non-Indigenous, there were a few non-Indigenous people that we met with, but were closely with tribes and First Nations. Uh, we heard mostly from the Southern panel and uh, we did not engage with participants in the Yukon panel region. Uh, early in the project, the Earth Economics team worked to develop a, an appropriate framework to guide the project and the analysis um, with well-being associated with social cultural values at the center of the framework, uh, a couple categories came about in, in this work, and that includes indigenous management, so looking at rights, management systems, responsibilities, laws and government, treaties and other agreements and resistance, uh, knowledge and practices, that looked into traditional values and traditional knowledge, tools and clothing, stories, beliefs, ways of processing, preserving and cooking fish, language, identity, heritage, art, dance, and song, and, and going fishing. Uh, human and ecological health was another uh, key uh, part of the framework, which includes physical and mental health, but also looks at the health of the ecosystem, the health of the forest, the riparian areas, the rivers. Uh, livelihood, livelihoods, wealth, security, tribal and First Nation, commercial fisheries, food, trade, and non-fishing jobs. Uh, and then last but not least, social. So family, community, uh, cohesion, gathering, ceremony, giving and sharing, uh, passing to future generations. We also looked at uh, uh, sentiments associated with each of these categories, and I'll go into more detail there, but looking at positive sentiments, but also negative sentiments. And then third, uh, desired sentiments, what are the hopes? <clears throat> uh, we, we looked to local studies to develop a social cultural value framework to understand the significance of salmon and refine these uh, categories based on conversations with project advisors and feedback from caucus members. And so we're, this, the work we did isn't really something new. We have to acknowledge, we've adopt, adapted this from the Swinomish Indian uh, tribal community and the Quinault Indian Nations work and uh, provided citations there. If you'd like to read a little bit more. But as one participant explained, quote, we don't want to put a dollar value on fish. It means more to us than that. One of the sayings that First Nations have, both in Canada and in the United States, is that when the last tree is gone, when the last fish is gone, only then will people find out that you can't eat money. That's something that we have in common with the folks that we work with in the United States, is that we have the same kind of belief system because we are family. Because before Canada and the United States existed, we existed and we had those feelings about fish. So to understand additional factors beyond the core sociocultural framework that also shape well-being, we included additional categories for the analysis. Um, so this is just looking at one of the, of the five 
categories, but these concepts emerge from interviews and relevant literature and include ecology, so most pr uh, prominently changes to salmon populations, climate change, and habitat loss, which is also tied to economies and colonial governance, such as dams, commercial fisheries, and recreational fisheries, but also regulations setting priorities and excluding indigenous people from decision making and access to salmon. A quote related to this is uh, the following. For over 150 years, we have been displaced from the responsibility of being stewards of our land, managing our res own resources, and really looking after our own salmon and other resources. The government made us dependent through residential schools, through the Indian Act and division of our communities. We had 24 nations that was comprised of one nation, the Stalo nation, and the government decided to divide us because it was much easier to locate us in places that had limited to no resources and lands and areas that were not suitable for growing or lands that were, or water that were not located near to our salmon resources. Uh, social changes. We then looked at discrimination and generational changes, research science, issues of gaps, lack of funding and exclusions in research and science programs, especially those run by tribes and First Nations. Also not shown here, uh, the analysis recognized uh, other related concepts like transformation, collaboration, really important one, participation and recovery. Um, so we encourage you, encourage you to uh, look at the report for, for uh, more detail. So how do we quantify uh, qualitative information? So following the principles of qualitative analysis, the framework we developed is distributed into uh, codes. So basically we, we uh, used a, a program, a software uh, called MaxQDA that helps us, uh, we, we input, like here are the codes we want to, to focus on. Uh, and it looks for topics, concepts that are brought up in interviews and we tag portions of the interview related to each code. So coding went through an intensive process of review and revision. Uh, analysis of codes helps the researchers identify trends and observations they may have missed in, in the interview. Uh, three rounds of analysis took place. Um, this is, we want to make sure there was the rigor behind this, the science and texts were analyzed from a grounded perspective to identify concepts communicated by participants, even or the, these varied from the initial framework. Um, so narrative segments, words, phrases, sentences, even paragraphs associated with each concept were, were tagged through this program. Uh, and then these new concepts uh, were reviewed and integrated into the overall coding scheme, uh, then applied to all text, including those that have been coded under the previous version of the framework. Um, and all coded texts were reviewed by different analysts to ensure consistency across the analysts. And as a result of this, uh, of the analysis, we can see which codes appeared more frequently as visualized in this histogram. Uh, important to note, the, the histogram does not represent importance of topic, only the number of times mentioned. Uh, so the top occurrence of codes include uh, salmon populations. All interviews emphasize the loss of salmon and the implications of those losses for indigenous communities, especially in terms of cultural identity and the way of living that has been passed on for generations. This is why the code for salmon most frequently overlapped with the code uh, for loss. And a quote that is a good example of this is, is follow. I don't know how to describe this one best other than to say that we are in a major salmon crisis right now. We are losing our cultural identity to the salmon and who we are as people of the river, the Stalo. And so each year, that passes by, each day that passes by, each minute that passes by, and we don't have an opportunity to conduct and practice the fishery, we are losing our cultural identity. 
and eventually will, the way things are going on and existing, uh, subsisting and the things that go along with that are incredibly important. So I would say we find ourselves in a salmon crisis this year and have been for decades now. Another uh, top occurrence in, that came out of the analysis was uh, food. The code for food represents more than having a healthy source of protein, but is also associated with sharing among friends, family, communities. Ecology and habitat uh, often refer to the keystone role of salmon in the larger ecosystem and nutrient cycle and uh, the changes participants have, have observed in those ecologies and habitats. Uh, gatherings uh, under the social domain, uh, participants also frequently discuss the need to have salmon for gatherings and ceremonies or the gatherings and ceremonies that occur around harvesting and processing salmon. And then uh, spiritual, oh, sorry, and then also important is the top occurrence was spiritual and belief uh, that salmon are to be respected, uh, the, that they are a family member, a person. So using our analysis software, we could also identify the most common words and phrases from uh, transcripts. Uh, this phrase cloud shows the most common two to five word phrases. Uh, climate change was mentioned the most, following, followed by uh, commercial fishing and the traditional knowledge. Uh, the one that stood out to the research team the most was the phrase, everything is connected. So codes often overlap, uh, which uh, help to show connections across topics and show again how everything is connected. Um, and so this image kind of shows the, those connections between the codes. The loss code uh, had the most intersections of any code, connecting the codes across all domains, uh, co occurred with salmon populations, food, habitat, ecology. Um, and this uh, quote, I think, ex uh, expresses the, um, that very well. I don't know how to describe this one best other than to say that we are in a major salmon. Oh, my apologies, I already read that one. <laughs> there were a lot of good quotes and uh, I just wanna make sure I'm including um, let me put a pause here. Uh, sorry, the food code that I wanted to talk about intersects with going fishing, physical health. Um, the, the quote there was uh, from a, a young participant, or, or sorry, the younger generations aren't learning how to fish as much anymore for a number of reasons. Some were never taught because they lost the knowledge holders in their community. Others are losing the desire because it's becoming harder and harder and some are not going out getting fish because the salmon simply aren't there anymore. Instead, they are replacing salmon with easier, more obtainable food sources that maybe aren't as healthy. Uh, going fishing intersected with passing to future generations, family gatherings, ceremonies and traditional knowledge. Uh, and so, those are the kind of overall codes. Now we're gonna go into the specific um, sentiments associated with each of these codes um, that came up in, in the interviews. And there were three sentiments, positive, negative, and desire. Positive sentiments include uh, looking at uh, codes and words like happiness, pride, respect, appreciation, awe, hope, and uh, similarly uplifting feelings. Uh, most frequent associations, going fishing, <laughs> um, food, cohesion, family, gatherings and ceremonies, spiritual and belief systems. And the, a quote, an example of this is uh, this following quote. So I'm an optimist and the salmon is always going to be part of who we are. It is always going to be a part of our culture. It is always going to be a part of our economy. 
it is always going to be there to help us move our sense of purpose and life forward. For the negative sentiments, uh, terms include fear, anger, worry, uh, frustration, <clears throat> and the frequent uh, associations were salmon populations, non-indigenous governance, uh, ecology and habitat, food, interesting that food is both positive and negative, uh, climate change and access. And a quote, an example of that uh, negative sentiment is the following quote. When I sit with groups with my brothers and sisters from the South, the other First Nations come to the table and express their frustrations and their sadness over the loss of their ability to harvest fish. It really hurts my soul to hear that people are not even getting access to their basic food fish requirements. In more recent years, we have been struggling with poor Chinook returns and have had to adjust our food fishing practices for the sake of uh, conservation. But we had never been in a situation where we can't go out and harvest food fish. And the third uh, sentiment uh, looks at wishes, needs, hopes, and dreams. And the frequent uh, associations uh, are salmon populations, uh, sea salmon at pre-contact heritage runs, share responsibility to ensure salmon for future generations, desire to address the drivers of why certain runs are declining, need to have full involvement of indigenous people in salmon management, jurisdiction and lawmaking. Another frequent association was indigenous laws, governance and institutions. Uh, Decision-making needs to include indigenous people and indigenous led salmon management needs greater support. Um, participants from the Canadian side of the border all kind of discussed the lack of meaningful representation um, and, and looked at uh, the the co-management model in Washington state, one person explained, we, we aspire to have it. We are looking to get it. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the table with regards to reconciliation and co-management, but we are definitely not there yet. And we should have a greater voice at the table. Another uh, desire sentiment was ecology and habitat to restore salmon habitat, improving water quality, doing everything possible to recover depleted stocks to quote, turn, turn the cycle around. <clears throat> um, another uh, desired sentiment was future generations, responsibility to ensure salmon and other first foods are available for future generations. Uh, they, there's worry that um, uh, the children would rarely fish or see or even taste salmon. Uh, indigenous cultures rely on the transmission of culture through passing on experiences going fishing and especially is especially important for that. Um, and the last two, non-Indigenous governments, the hope that the report can communicate Indigenous values to non-Indigenous people, especially that salmon are more than money, uh, should be uh, government's responsibility to protect Indigenous rights and not make Indigenous communities fight for their rights. And then last, uh, but also very important, collaboration. Work together to save salmon and stop fighting over the last fish for everyone's benefit. Um, there was a quote saying, everyone must share the responsibility for salmon. So the overall insights from the report um, includes uh, emphasis on, um, and, and this is also emphasized in past reports, uh, beyond this project is that Pacific salmon are a cultural and ecological keystone species, irreplaceable and core to the identities and ways of life of indigenous communities throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, salmon are integral to, uh, to family structures, community cohesion, gatherings and ceremonies and practices. Um, Uh, indigenous, indigenous communities need salmon for mental and physical health. Uh, conversations around having salmon to eat overlapped with those about community well-being, which is tied to fishing, gathering, and ceremonies, wealth, 
and cultural continuity through sharing traditions and traditional knowledge. Um, every participant shared stories of the impacts of salmon decline uh, that tied to almost every other code in the, in the framework. Um, so this loss of salmon is a cultural crisis and without salmon ceremonies, food security, traditions, uh, learning economies and health all suffer. And uh, cultural needs, knowledge systems, traditions and practices are central to indigenous uh, management approaches. Yet these are rarely acknowledged, much less incorporated into agency management decisions. <clears throat> so uh, one quote here is that came from the interviews. I hear it from elders, the future of the salmon, the 30 million we have seen come up the river, the year round fishing of salmon that we used to have, used to have, that would be the ultimate future for the tribes. But right now, I think it is to improve the watersheds. The tribes are working hard to help these fish throughout Indian country and the future of the tribe. We want our first foods to never go away, to break the cycle. I just hope that the tribe's future and our generations and generations to come. Um, so with that, the main recommendations from the report um, to kind of help protect and also restore that cycle <laughs> that the participant mentioned uh, is to first restore salmon runs. As we learn throughout this process, it is critical that this is done in coordination with indigenous communities to ensure that indigenous communities are able to meet food, social and ceremonial salmon needs, both now and in the future. The second key recommendation is to include indigenous knowledge with mainstream fisheries management approaches to help restore salmon ecosystems. And there, there must be additional funding and support uh, for those indigenous systems. Third recommendation is about co-management uh, related, uh, related to the comment following the, the Washington state model where there is equal sharing of decision-making power between uh, tribes. In general, we hear the need for greater need for meaningful part participation in decision-making that can help expand opportunities for collaboration. And finally, and most importantly, to recognize the respect, to recognize and respect tribal and First Nation sovereignty. We heard this from both sides of the border, but we heard this most from uh, Canadian First Nations. So to conclude, I will uh, end a quote, not from this project, but from the late Billy Frank Jr., whom I had the pleasure of meeting and actually interviewing 13 years ago when I was a research analyst at Earth Economics working on the economic value of the Nisqually's uh, watersheds ecosystems. <clears throat> Our principles and proposed solutions have followed the same principles of stewardship we have always followed and have placed our spiritual connection with Mother Earth at the top of our priority list, where it belongs. This is where the priority belongs for everyone, Indian or not, because we are all born with the responsibility to take care of our planet and the life that exists here. We are all dependent on the health of our ecosystem whoever we are and whatever we do. So with that, uh, I would like to thank the Pacific Salmon Commission for their uh, support of this project, the Southern Endowment Fund for funding this work, uh, Gord Sterrett, Ron Allen, Murray Ned, McCoy Oatman and Russ Jones for advising the work, um, the project participants and First Nations and tribal caucuses to the, uh, the Pacific Salmon Commission for making the project possible. Also, it was an honor to hear from the late Lorraine Loomis. We highlighted many of her contributions in the report and encourage you to, to look into, into the report. We also like to thank the First Nations and Tribal Caucuses. Um, also, Dr. Don Hall and Dr. Gary Morishima for their review and input, uh, the Kaufman and Associates Incorporation for their beautiful design work, 
Teen Award for uh, the, being a project research assistant for this. And we're grateful for you to continue working with us at Earth Economics. Um, and, well, and the whole project, Earth Economics project team, especially Olivia Molden and Angela Fletcher, who are uh, both on maternity leave until, until April. And if you'd like to, again, it's on the, the full report is on the PSC website, but you can also go to the earthaconomics.org forward slash PSC URL, and you'll see buttons here for the full report and the, the fact sheet that we produced and also some interactive um, maps here, highlighting certain quotes based on the theme that, that we highlighted in the framework. Um, and then also just a couple of other nifty maps here to, to explore. So with that, I will uh, open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Maya. That was, uh, that was great, uh, really comprehensive and I, I'm humbled to see that we have uh, almost 230 participants joining us today. I think that's a record for a PSC session. And um, I think you, you and the rest of the panel should be very proud of that audience that you've attracted. Um, first up, I don't see any typed questions yet coming in through the Q&A button, but I do see Ken Malloway has raised his hand. Uh, John, can you unmute him? Uh, go ahead, Ken. I think you're unmuted. John, let me know if that's not the case. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the report. Um, and thanks for uh, for uh, your work too, John. Um, John came to uh, to uh, give a report to. Uh, the uh, First Nations and the U.S. tribes a few years ago <laughs> now. And um, we kind of blew them out of the water because, uh, because of the, 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 the way it came down. Uh, it's, a, it's almost impossible to put up a, a dollar value on uh, what we're talking about. And that was the message that we gave to him. So uh, he went away and he came back with, um, uh, with this... Uh, um, project, and I wanted to thank uh, Earth Economics for the work that they've done. Um, we're also doing uh, uh, similar work uh, on Lower Fraser. It's called Revitalizing Indigenous Law with the Lower Fraser Fisheries Alliance. And um, it's a similar uh, project. One of the things that we always do uh, when we start off a process like this is we start off with a prayer. I can't speak my language very well. Uh, my language is beaten out of my mom and dad when they were in residential school. But uh, Joe Alec taught us a prayer, a very short, concise prayer. I'm going to try and say it. It's a Saasamach Iqualo, Chomat Tamakstram Iqualat. This is our land. We have to take care of everything that belongs to us. That's a very, very short prayer, but it's a very concise. And that's that's the way we started off every meeting. And um, the I guess I, I don't want to take up too much time. The, just the last thing. Um, Murray mentioned it earlier uh, that because of COVID that we've only we, we were only able to reach out to a handful of folks. There's 96 Indian bands on the Fraser River. And we only heard from a couple of them because of uh, COVID. In the 1980s, I was contacted by this Carrier Secondary Tribal Council. They were having a salmon ceremony. They were planning it, but they couldn't get any fish at all. And they, they knew that I was a very, very good fisherman down here um, and, and asked if I could catch them some fish. And so I went out and I caught um, fish for them. And I brought up literally a ton of early steward sockeye, which are their sockeye. And uh, so that could feed their people. And um, after, uh, after the uh, ceremony um, was over, one of the, 
the women from the carrier seconded group came up to me and uh, she she had her kids there with her. She said, Kenny, I want to thank you for bringing these fish all the way up here. It's a long, long drive. It's a lot of work. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. But she said, I don't want my kids to think that fish get here in a truck. Thanks. Thank you, Chief Malloway. Um, I also, we have a couple other hands up and some questions coming in through q and I'll go to, um, let's see, Gerald, I see you had your hand up, but I also see you typed your question in, so I'll just go to that. Um, it says, thanks for the report. I'm saddened to not hear values or responsibility. The other is if was only others don't understand, as I think for the most part, they have a good idea, but there are too many conflicts of interest on the non-fish concerned populations. Uh, timber development, housing, water consumption, water pollution, and agriculture, to name a few. I don't know if there's a question embedded in there, but um, perhaps Maya or other panelists if you wanted to take that. Sure, I, can, I can take a stab at it. Um, so I guess, the, yes, there's this larger issue, but the main focus of the report Report was around the social cultural uh, values of the indigenous groups, how that connects to other industries and sectors was uh, a bit beyond the, the scope of, of this project, but I think you bring up a good point that there are, the, are these other factors to look at for, for future, future work or discussions. It looks like Ron may have a response too. Well, I, yeah, thanks Maya. Um, uh, it's a it's a great question. Uh, our objective um, to this report was just to capture um, as best we could um, the the importance of salmon to our communities. It is true that um, we're um, we're butting heads with growth and development um, throughout the Northwest. Um, and it doesn't matter whether uh, it's growth in terms of more people coming to the Northwest because they because they like it, and, and we have a population growth, and, and all the consequences as a, all the results due to it, meaning more homes, more um, uh, uh, employ, uh, uh, more different kinds of industries that's being developed, <clears throat> and and we totally understand the conflicts that exist out there with regard to the growth. So timber industry is growing and it's continued to expand. We're doing the best we can on both sides of the border to make the timber industry responsible, the agriculture industry responsible, dealing with the parian zones and so forth, dealing with stormwater issues, all those issues that, that, can, that collide with um, the, uh, the health and the, and the interest of our salmon. So um, it, it is a, a challenge, but one of our objectives, you know, is to educate. Um, we in, in, in the indigenous world find, our, find it an ongoing job to educate on, and, and continue to remind the non-Indian cultures uh, why we have to coexist responsibly and respectfully. Um, that is a challenge for us. And uh, this is one of our tools to educate, um, to enlighten. And while we, we fight for the, pre the preservation, restoration of salmon um, and throughout the Northwest, up the, Columbia, up the Columbia River, up the Fraser River, and every other river system that has different stocks and species, <clears throat> um, um, you know, throughout the whole Northwest. And it's been a wrestling match. And that's what we do here in the US Canada is to find that right responsible balance um, from Alaska to the South. So uh, uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, and we weren't tackling that. That is being tackled on parallel tracks um, uh, by both uh, parties, meaning Canada and the United States. And um, it's, a, it's a heavy lift uh, to say the obvious. It, we, we constantly work hard at um, the federal governments and, and the provinces and the states, you know, to do the responsible thing um, and recognize our people as important components to the solution, 
because our peoples live on the river. They live with the salmon. And so uh, we're, we, are, we are the canary in, the, the, in the, uh, the mine when it comes to the health of salmon. So um, I guess that's my thoughts about uh, that question. Thank you, Ron. Um, I'll go to Commissioner Doug Vincent Lang from Alaska. I see his hand is up and I think John can unmute him. Uh, there, Doug, I think you're, you're ready to go now. There you go. Okay. okay. Can you hear me, John? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, first off, I want to thank the authors for this report. You know, your, your report really conform, confirmed the importance of salmon as a cultural and traditional activities across the Pacific Northwest. And it was well, well researched and well reported and and the presentation was great. Thank you for taking time to, to highlight it for us. Um, it really also highlighted the importance of salmon as a food source, you know, not only to the native people that live in the Pacific Northwest, but I think in general about the how salmon are important for food. And those same issues that you've identified throughout your geography of study area of study are just as important in Alaska. You know, we have a subsistence priority in our state and those same issues are facing many of our peoples in Alaska from food security and cultural and significant purposes. So, you know, um, I was really intrigued by the word charts you showed and all the different issues that, that are facing the, the, how you deal with management of salmon and, and maintenance of these cultural and socioeconomic purposes moving forward. And it really highlighted the need that we're going to have to build partnerships together, not only between the governments, but also the governments and the First Nations and, and Native people that live in the region about how we tackle these things, because clearly we can't tackle them individually. It's gonna take, like Ron said, you know, a concerted effort across the different jurisdictions to ensure that we are able to maintain salmon and maintain their conservation into future generations. Um, I do have one question. Um, and, you know, in Alaska, one of the issues that we face is, is not only do we, um, we have subsistence as a food resource, but really commercial fishing is integrally tied into provision of cultural resources because you need a cash economy to basically go out and collect food for your cultural resources. Did you guys tackle at all that issue of the interrelationship between the economic value of salmon versus food security and cultural resources and, and how you find that balance? That's a great question, Doug. Uh, at Earth Economics, we, we have looked at the economic monetary value of, of salmon and ecosystems, but we did not do that for this report for one main, main reason. We've noticed when, when we do a qualitative analysis next to a quantitative analysis, people always zone into the number, the, the big, those numbers, and then the tends to overshadow the, the qualitative. Uh, analysis. And so it was important for the, the advisors, the, the tribes and First Nations to focus on the social cultural, the non-monetary, uh, non-economic uh, value of salmon because they didn't feel like that's being represented well enough in the previous report that that was mentioned earlier at the beginning of this um, presentation. There was a economic analysis done uh, it was a good analysis, except it had very little about the, the indigenous uh, contribution or to connections to salmon. Um, so no, this report did not look at the, the economic uh, aspects specifically. <clears throat> Mainly well, again, specific. thank, thank you for your report and your presentation. Really appreciate, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Maya. Um, see a question from uh, the username is McMurray R. Uh, the question is, were you able to estimate the level of optimism that groups had towards the future of salmon? Not in great detail, but we, we did find that the um, negative and positive sentiments were pretty evenly split. So I don't know if that helps answer, answer your question. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks. 
thanks for that. Um, it looks like there's a question in, uh, there's a statement from Gerald in the chat session. Um, Gerald, would you like to, um, I know we did not go to you live. Would you like to, uh, yeah, I see your hand up. Go ahead, we'll unmute you. I think you're good to go. I think that's GI. Yeah, I think I made it. Oh, hey, GI. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, good discussions. I'm glad we're having them. Uh, haven't had a chance to look at the report yet. Um, <clears throat> you know, interested in doing so. So um, just wanted to make some comments on, yeah, we're, we've been putting fish in the freezer because of conservation for over 30 years. Now we have a couple of generations that believe it's the tribe's responsibility to provide fish for gatherings, for funerals, for weddings, for graduations, instead of the, our value system is, no, that's individuals within the community's responsibility to go do as Ken did for uh, his relatives. And um, that's a huge, loss in our uh, our value system that it can't be quantified by money can't be really quantified uh, uh, other than a cultural genocide that this is happening to us because of things that we didn't create we're here to try to help fix them but there that's a, a loss where yeah, when I was a fisher and on the fish commission, um, you know, for youth or for elders, I could go out and say, hey, we need some uh, contributions here uh, for our elders or for our youth. And you'd pull up to a, a fisher and they'd say, yeah, I'm, uh, how many do you need? Tell me when. And you could get as many fish as you wanted. Uh, for uh, our community. Now, it, it, we've been put into a system where now they, they got to be able to sell every fish they get to try to survive, to pay heat and lights and gas and uh, food. It, it's no longer uh, able to, so we've lost another uh, value system that we have and belief in where we take care of each other uh, in the community. So it's uh, what's happening is just not a calculation. It doesn't fit into a model. Uh, you can't model it. You can't put a price on it, but it exists in in that uh, to where we've suffered a huge, huge loss in our uh, community and our value system. So just wanted to express that. Thank you. Thank you, GI. Uh, Russ, I'll go to you. And I then I have a question from Andrew in the audience. Yeah, Gerald, no, thanks for pointing that out. And, um, you know, distribution and sharing, you know, systems have changed. And, and I just go back, you know, here 50 years ago, in Haida Gwaii, um, you know, we had used to have many more people who were actively involved in the fisheries and they had their own boats. And because of licensing and economics, you know, they've lo we've lost that access. And we're looking at, you know, kind of through new agreements, you know, we're, we're trying to restore some of that access and hoping that, that we will have those um, resources in the community. But, you know, in the interim, you know, uh, things like our, our our First Nation governments, you know, have um, tried to fill the gap, right? And and so we, we have a mix, you know, of, 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 you know, some communal harvest and um, distribution in the community. And, um, and you know, many people, you know, uh, appreciate and, and need that, 
but we also have um, other many who are still involved as individuals and ha have boats and and share fish. So so it is kind of a mix and and it's it's a change in in circumstances. It's, and we're lucky in some ways that we don't have the same um, um, issues that that in say that might be in some southern areas where we still it's not fisheries aren't closed for conservation reasons. So we can still you know, harvest for food, social, ceremonial purposes, where the others, tribes or nations which are um, in more re remote locations in a watershed, right, or or in the approach areas, you know, don't have that that access. So, so thanks for your question. Thank you, Russ. Uh, Murray, I'll, um, I see your hand up, and then I can go to the question from the audience. Yeah, I'll just share a little more. Uh, in addition to what Russ said in um, Gerald's comments and question, but you know, I mentioned four decades ago when uh, the fish were plentiful. You know, our families would spend time at the river. Matter of fact, we'd camp there. Some of our, my grandmother, my family would camp there for the summer, and so that there was this connection, complete connection to the river and the water, and of course the fish as they came in and were caught and those are. But the exact same thing is happening today that Ken mentioned about. Now we've only got five or six key fishermen, fisherwomen that participate. As Russ mentioned, to invest that kind of money into boats and nets and gear for the amount of time that you're able to get out and practice a fishery has become a real concern. And so similarly, you know, these five or six fishermen are tasked with fishwomen, bringing fish, fish back to the community for a couple of processing days annually. And as Ken mentioned, that's not the way we want to see the fishery go into the future. And so our mindset is now, okay, well, we can't continue to bring fish back. We've got to bring the people to the river and uh, connect to the river, connect to the fish, connect to the fishers, and bring that back the way it should have been. So it's a completely different mindset that we have to try and change in the midst of the crisis that we're in to maintain that cultural integrity. Thank you, Murray. Um, the question from Andrew in the audience is, how is the split between coastal nations and interior nations? I ask because a lot of meetings seem to me to be about river fisheries. Uh, Murray, do you wanna take that or someone else? Well, maybe Gord or somebody, but yeah, I, I can take a, a run out of it. Um, I think one of the things about crisis is it, brings people together. Whether you're First Nations, recreational or commercial sector, agencies, individuals, um, crisis does that. And so, you know, uh, back in the day, there was enough fish to fight over between the coastal and interior Fraser First Nations. But with the amount of fish that are left now, we have to find a collective way forward. And that's just the reality when it comes to crisis, there's no time to fight over the last fish. And so in our, in our, um, in our language, our Halkamalem language, let us uh, means one heart, one mind. <clears throat> and that's that connectivity amongst each other within our tribe, but also the, the need for that collaboration, that cooperation uh, for us up and down the Fraser River and the marine area where these fish migrate. So yeah, I mean, there's always, there's been that contention, but I, I would say there's more collaboration and cooperation in recent years. And it's it's a funny thing because it is about crisis. And hopefully when the fish return, that uh, collaboration will continue. Maybe Gord has another thing to offer there. Looks like we have agreement with Gord. Um, oh, wait a minute, I, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, in the Fraser River, panel, it, it is about, uh, you know, both this north and the south and the 92 tribes that fish on the Fraser River. When you go to the southern panel, then you see the stuff that's going on on the Vancouver Island up north, you know, the fisheries up north and the, and the transboundary fishery. So they are all uh, in the mix. And then now in recent years, the Okanagan territory um, is in the mix in that conversation about their stocks and species. So um, they each have their own respective form um, where their interest on the, the status of the stocks um, 
uh, the species in the different stocks that they're concerned about um, are being addressed. So uh, I think it's it's and it's better balanced than you think. Um, but Fraser just takes a Fraser historically has always been a big fishery, and so it, it, it has always attracted a lot of attention because of the magnitude and recently because of the decline um, of of some of this um, some of the cycles. So um, so maybe it's a little. It, it, it skews the perception that it's all about Fraser River and not about the other uh, fisheries, um, uh, both on the coast and, and interior. Thanks, Ron. I, I see a typed uh, question from Wilbur. I assume that's Wilbur Slakish. Uh, good to see you, Wilbur. Um, yes, we can uh, promote you, Wilbur, to, uh, to speak your question live. Um, John, can you promote Wilbur? Just there we go, Wilbur. Go ahead. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hmm. Okay, now I've go. seen the unmute button. Yeah, uh, that's one thing there that we neglected to mention in in our report when we were doing the questions. We were independent until uh, the settlers started arriving. We could harvest, food gathering, everything, and then when uh, the efficient people of Europe start, Europe arrived. They started uh, uh, over harvesting, and when they started uh, the canning process, they went hog wild, thinking that the uh, the fish would always be abundant like that. And uh, we lost our access to uh, to harvest our fish, our people, and we were restricted, and we had to adapt to different foods and. Uh, access to our, our all of our food sources so uh, you know one, once we could go and and get what we needed now we have to get a a paper from our tribe to to go until uh after the first ceremonies and then we're restricted numbers and, and uh, that's one thing there that we have lost is our, our, our independency and then make us dependent upon their uh, uh, food programs that they, they instituted when they restricted our access to the river, all with uh, chemicals and salt. And that's why we have the, the uh, high diabetes and other things there, because it's still going on today. We have limited numbers. and. Uh, to access our natural food supply. Uh, all of our foods have been plowed under that we can gather, but we neglected to mention that. And uh, the, the irrigation, uh, contaminated water. But I, I, I think that's one thing there that uh, we forgot to mention in that report. We've lost a lot and independence was one of them. Now we're dependent upon, like was said earlier, the tribe furnishing, like GI said, the tribe has to furnish the fish for these things, uh, for our ceremonies and all of that. So uh, that's all that I have, John. And uh, I'm sorry, I I should have mentioned that when I was uh, being interviewed. Thank you. Thank you, Wilbur. Um, I see a new. Um, Question from Rose uh, Kishnerook. Uh, let me take a stab. Um, it says in the Alsec system, Yukon territory, uh, in that context, I look forward to the day that we can work with and interact with our neighboring nations in Alaska. We have ancestral families from Dry Bay and Yucatan. We shared so much. We have been uh, we have been disconnected primarily because of our USA and Canadian border. Our people have been disconnected and need to reconnect. Forgive me while I scroll down here. Um, 
culture, they need to reconnect culturally, economically, as we once did free, freely did as first peoples of the area. We manage just fine. How can we create agreements between our two countries that allow and respect this? I know this seems like a loaded question, but this is a vital piece to our connection here in the Yukon uh, to Alaska. That's in the chat if people would like to um, see it. We should put that question into the UN. <laughs> it's a, those cross border, I, I joking aside, the cross border issues are complicated. Um, and culturally, with, and we've said that many a time, uh, and many uh, of our folks here in the South have always said, you know, that the border has, you know, is a political system that's created a bright line between cultures that cross right through cultures. And, and we're having to cope and deal with it. So it's true in the Yukon, um, and it's true down South here as well. Um, it's true in Alaska, that, that's why we have a transboundary. Um, panel that deals with the fisheries that go up into uh, BC um, and the fisheries that fish out in the in Alaskan waters. Um, and it's true down here, um, uh, you know, like in the, in the, uh, um, the, the uh, all along the, the, the northern border here. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, we have to figure out a way to, to, to try to be respectful of the, of uh, why the indigenous rights um, cross over borders um, and, uh, and, and how we can make that work more respectfully. Thank you, Ron. I'll, I'll amplify that um, by, by referencing the Yukon River panel in the PSC um, context. Rose, I'm sorry, I don't know you well, but um, that if you don't know about the Yukon panel, it is uh, trying to facilitate those cross-border exchanges. They apply for funding every year to the Yukon uh, Endowment Fund, and they do cross-border community exchanges uh, that I think have been pretty helpful. Some of those are summarized on their on the panel's website. It's um, yukonriverpanel.com. Uh, you can also access it through a link in, in psc.org. And they have reports from those community exchanges uh, and, and the plans to move those ahead. Um, for our panelists, I see another question in the Q&A button from Greg Witzke. Uh, he asks, are there any plans to continue with studies like this report, but focus it on the economic costs associated with salmon declines? In other words, personal health issues, family breakdown, community crime, addiction, et cetera. I mean, to take a stab at that one. Go ahead, Gordon. Hey, Greg. Um, thanks for the question. Um, and it's a good question. It's something that I think we've all thought about while this report was going on um, and evolving. And we recognize that this was a this this report was with a focus group um, from the PSC, from the from the tribes and the First Canadian First Nations, um, but that. There could be opportunity to 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 expand it broadly. Um, it might address some of the questions that you've asked. It might address some of the questions that wrote or the question that Rose just or the issue that Rose just raised, and in the side chat. And um, so we've talked about it. Um, we don't know if it's appropriate for our caucuses to just stick on all that. But um, there's definitely room for um, expansion and to address some of those questions and concerns that you just addressed or identified. Thank you. Thanks, Gord. Uh, GI has posted a follow up comment um, that you can see in the question and answer box. Um, he says, this issue isn't new. Lummi led a study called the Values Project Northwest. It was done around 1982 by Florence Cluchon from the UW. There are many findings in it. Among them was that most natives believe in outcome-oriented decision-making, while for the most part, non-natives believe in process decision-making. Natives believe mostly in making decisions based on past teachings while planning for the future, while most non-natives are here and now, uh, I think, presented as the past is gone and the future isn't here yet. 
The study is enlightening for why we have so many difficult discussions. So I don't see a question in that, but it is helpful uh, for me to see that context. Um, are there, if there are other questions, uh, people can raise their hand or, um, or type it in the Q&A through the Q&A window. Teresa Ryan um, says, there's no funding available for that type of analysis. The connections between the failure of resources use and the ongoing chronic health issues is real. Speaking to Andrew's question earlier. Um, let me go. I see an attendee has raised their hand. GI, uh, did you want to follow up on what I just uh, spoke to? John, you might have to um, unmute GI, Gerald. There you go, GI. I think you're good to go now. But you're going to have to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up a little bit. The, that study is probably, you know, participated uh, by tribes as well as uh, several uh, Washington state agencies. Uh, in the 80s, and it it's really follows along with all the stuff that we're discussing here. It's not, and it may be helpful uh, for others to see some of those things because it's, um, you know, the the value systems that we have are quite different, and the, trying to just uh, put words in saying, well, you're just if I just say it this way, <laughs> you'll understand. Well, I, I think for the most part, they actually understand. It's just their value system is different than ours uh, for the most part. And so just wording isn't going to help, but I think understanding what, what the differences are may help um, us uh, having better discussions. Uh, for the most part. I mean, that's not everybody, both on the tribal native side or on the state uh, or um, non-native side, but I think it'd be helpful for folks to uh, grab a hold of that and read it. It's probably a 200 page study, so, uh, but I don't think things have changed much since then. So just thought I'd add that in, thanks. Thank you, GI. Um, a question from Kim Charlie in the chat bar says, will there be more information gathered in the future to add to the data gathered presently, or maybe a part two to this report? I'll take a run at that, John. Thank you for the question, Kim. As long as you're willing to participate, I'm sure we can do anything is the answer. But um, I think we, I think we, as tribes and nations probably have to step back a bit and take a look at the work that's been done. And, you know, Greg Witzke asked a good question about the economic side of things and if there's an interest in uh, doing something like that. So I think we have to let this one settle a bit, but uh, maybe not too long and figure out if the tribes and nations want to proceed with um, something into the future, like a phase two. And I, I can I can share that the nations in Canada have a strong interest in um, figuring out a way forward. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of work uh, uh, from this kind of capacity and expertise invested. Some nations have, but a lot haven't. And so there's a strong interest. So we'll see where we can go with it. Thank you, Murray. Uh, I see Ed Johnstone has his hand up to speak. Um, John, can you uh, promote Ed to unmute? Ed, I think you're good to go. But you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, I can follow some instructions, thank you. <laughs> you're good. You know, uh, I want to uh, I want to uh, 
thank everybody that um, is involved in this project. Um, being, uh, I think, interviewed years ago and then reset the dial. Um, this is a very emotional subject um, for us. Uh, you know, uh, I hear my relative on, from the Fraser, Murray, uh, and, and all of our uh, relatives throughout Indian country talking about our way of life that we once knew Wilbur, my friend Wilbur from down on the Columbia River. It's really hard to, uh, I think, educate the populations that came here uh, to a land that was once all occupied by us. We, we, uh, we had a life that how we dealt with each other, you know, there's a long history there, uh, confrontation and so forth, our cultures, salmon people, people of the water, what we knew then and what we know now and what we need to work on for the future is really important. You know, myself, I can go back, you know, to 1960 with clarity a little bit before that, but when I first stepped in that canoe as a, uh, as a seven-year-old and uh, got in the bow of my brother-in-law uh, on the whole river on Western Washington here, mid coast. That's the way we fished in those days was out of a dugout canoe, 32, 34 feet long. And um, we, we, there was no, uh, no pressures from outside of anywhere. Um, Culture was alive. Village was very small. Village here at Tahola was very small. Queets uh, and all our coastal communities. And and the the massive um, deforestation and growth that Ron talks about when we're talking about some of these cultural units and problems that are that have come down the road. We're we're starting to catch up with it, and you know, only have to, you know you have to only have to look. You talk about the Europeans and so forth. You only have to look at commissioners' reports after we signed our treaties in the 1850s that talked about the fish, what they looked at in that 30 or 40 or 50 year period, and the warning signs that were there, but they were not acted upon in oh so many ways. So this report, you know, is us trying to get as much in, in there and feel the cover as we can to talk about who we are as Indian people and, and, and our way of life. And, um, the you know, who better to quote in there than Billy Frank Jr. that um, has that long history on the Nisqually River with his dad himself and now, he's, now his son. But that's a reflection of all of us. You just look in every Indian community, and that, that's where that, that every one of us have that story. Some, some a little more clear and some not, you know, because of what's happened to us over time. Um, and um, what, what I want to, want to um, I guess my message is here, we, we have... Um, we're, we're identifying all of these these uh, things that are happening to us in the natural world now with this climate is compounding that tremendously right now. And um, what what we need to continue to do is look forward to uh, the day when the comments from Murray and Ron and others on here were actually making those gains in those areas. So we can't say what I want, you know, I want the grandmother to know that, no, that is not the way that our fish come to us is in a pickup truck. I hear this story so often. Uh, I think that it's still a Guamish and the restrictions on that under the rebuilding plans when former Chairman Yannity and others have told us there's, there's no way to even teach their, their kids 
what what we experienced, what I experienced, what the tribal leaders on this call and from these villages and these transboundary issues, what it means to us in our way of life, no matter where we are, it's really hard to explain. Um, and and um, it takes a, a, an effort like this that becomes something that we've done here collectively to let the general population know that we're, we're still here, as Billy Frank Jr. said. Us Indians, we're still here. We're, we, have, we haven't gone anywhere. We're place-based. This is who we are. Thank, thank all of you tribal leaders and your staffs and your commitments in the Pacific Salmon Commission and the commitments to this resource that means so much to us. Um, uh, names that I hear that are involved, like Dr. Gary Morishima, you know, that I think I was first introduced to in the late 60s because of connection with my brother Guy McMines and the University of Washington School of Fishers and other names that we see on here, long-termers, advisors, analysts, telling us what needs to happen. And our, our, our uh, duty is to try to work with that and, and give them the policy directions that we need to make these critical decisions. And, uh, and uh, you know, when I think about my involvement long-term here and, and the good work that these uh, panels are doing and a lot of it is 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 asking us for that guidance, and and uh, I, I really I really believe that that's a that's the way. The the more we can refine that and answer those questions and move forward, in uh, this long term look, that's what it takes. A lot of people don't understand a hundred year plan or a fifty year plan when our sockeye are disappearing here at Quinault Indian Nation. And I had to reach out to Lummi Nation, the GI and others for my sister's funeral. In Upper Skagit. We don't know that here. We haven't been that exposed to that hardship, but it's here now. It's here with us, this beautiful Washington coast, million acre park, federal lands to help protect us. But the other indicators that we can't control, Mother Earth is telling us a lot. We have to pay attention and expand what we're thinking about here and how to react to that. On all, we know that as, as tribes here in, in, the, in uh, Washington State co-managers, our arenas are very, very, very structured to Pacific Fisheries Management Council, International Pacific Halibut Commission, Pacific Salmon Commission through that treaty are so critical that we have to cross hatch these all together to make those gains to protect our way of life. And by gosh, for all those that enjoyed coming to our country to live with us, we down here, we did that by agreements with the United States and treaties. And this process is done through a treaty And, and uh, I just can't express enough my appreciation for everybody in this project and to move it forward, to incorporate it. And, and my, my, uh, my objective here, particularly for Quinault and the others, is to, to show this process 
and the work and the concerns that we are doing both from the Pacific Salmon Commission and from our, our tribal communities. Because this is important work and it needs to have that be known and it needs to have the support. And I think that's that's uh, critical to how we move forward. And I thank you for uh, just these few words. Thank you, Ed, I appreciate that. Um, I do see Murray is typing an answer to the question posted by, posted by Joe Tatey. While that is um, he's coming forward, I'll go down to the next one. Um, from Will, William Atlas. He says, interesting observations from folks about the depth and history, decades of work, in fact, that have been done by indigenous peoples and their partners in documenting the fundamental importance of salmon to tribes and First Nations. Perhaps a focus on how to translate these values and needs more formally into the PST language and implementation process is needed. And, and that last part is the question. We've got about 13 minutes left in our time slot here. Do one of the panelists want to take that question from William? It's got three lights, so it's, several people have uh, found it compelling. Well, thanks for the question. Um, I'll take a stab at this one as well. I think. Um, I think it's definitely a, a consideration, um, and I, I, I guess I somewhat alluded to it um, in my response to Greg Witzke a little bit earlier, is that um, knowing, I mean, we just finished a round of negotiations, we're going into a round of negotiations in a number of years. Um, we're also looking at um, some of the um, influences on our fisheries and, um, and on the fish and the environment climate change and stuff like that. And it, it's definitely something that um, as um, indigenous peoples that we would consider to, to that would be appropriate um, in, an, in future PSC language. Um, but that's also up for, um, I guess, negotiation or discussion and um, in preparation by the two parties um, for 2028. Thanks, Gord. Well, uh, I'll, I'll add to Gord's uh, response, uh, John. Uh, <clears throat> so, on the one hand, um, I mean, the, the question ha it has layers of complexity to it. Um, and, and Gord's response is, is relative to the harvest side of the ledger of, of salmon restoration um, to healthy status. Um, that I always call healthy, sustainable status. So whatever they, whatever levels they should be. But uh, we always call the other four H's. You know, so you got the hydro factor. You know, and you got the uh, the, uh, you know, the the habitat uh, factor. So um, and um, what am I missing? I'm missing one of them. But uh, they all weigh into the solution. So. This report is of value because it helps enlighten those who uh, have responsibility um, to protect and restore salmon um, at, at wh wherever we have uh, uh, areas of jurisdiction from Alaska to the South. So um, how do we find that balance? How do we uh, deal with the recognition of growth um, and, the, and the speed of growth and the different elements of the growth and the, the points I made earlier about the timber industry, the, uh, the growing cities and towns and, and municipalities and, uh, and so forth. And, and you deal with uh, um, their practices um, in terms of how does it affect the environment? How does it affect the water? And, and then what can we also do relative to climate change? You know, the carbon reduction conversation that has an effect on the temperature of water. Um, and, and those kinds of factors. So um, we just have to continue to make the case that we, are, we in the indigenous world are part of the solution. And it's not just one, it's not just one factor. I, and I know I'm probably saying the obvious to everybody, 
but it's not just one factor. And so while we deal with harvest management practices um, responsibly relative to statement goals and what have you, um, we have to deal with the other H's um, so that, um, that, that we're creating the right kind of environment. Uh, in, the old, in the old days, we used to always talk about gravel to gravel. You know, we got to have a place for them to spawn, you know, in order for them to produce. But then they go out. Then they have to come back in a balanced way and uh, in a very complicated way because you're dealing with different species, different stocks, overlapping fisheries, and it gets more and more complicated. Then the, the climate change factor uh, weighs into this. And, and there are other factors that I fully don't understand. I say it's, it's way too complicated for me, but um, I know that they're, that they're a part of the problem. But these other uh, growth issues, um, we have to deal with. Um, and and uh, we got to keep pushing the envelope um, of doing the right thing. You know, dealing with uh, stormwater, dealing with wastewater, dealing with all the, you know, the growth, um, ships coming in and, uh, uh, and potential spills that can affect different environments, uh, uh, environmental conditions, et cetera. So we've made a lot of bad decisions in the last 200 years. So we're trying to reverse that and it's, it's not going to get reversed overnight. So, uh, uh, you know, we in the South, you know, deal with, you know, we wrestle with our Fed and our state uh, counterparts um, over what's the right thing to do. And, uh, and I know that our First Nation counterparts in, in BC are, are doing exactly the same thing. So we're, gonna, we're going to be disappointed because we didn't accomplish what we want, but we can't get discouraged. Um, and, and I don't think we do. This, this is one of the earlier questions. We're not going anywhere. We're staying here and we keep showing up and, and we keep showing up because we don't get discouraged. Um, the value is too important to our communities and to the Northwest. Uh, salmon is a part of who we are. That's, that's an old Billy phrase. Um, and so uh, that, that I think that when asked, what's the next step after this study? I don't know what it is, but um, I, surely solutions um, and how do you deal with the solutions is a big part of ne the next phase of the observations and findings of, of this uh, study that Myra, uh, Maya and, uh, and her team have conducted. Thank you, Ron. I don't see any new questions um, or hands raised and that's, that's a good, it's a good junction because we've got about seven minutes left in our time slot. I was wondering if, um, any of the uh, panelists wanted, or um, and Maya included, wanted to leave some parting thoughts for the group. Before I uh, mute myself again, I'll remind folks that we will post today's recording on our YouTube channel. There'll be a link for that um, somewhere on our PSC uh, website. I'll work with John Sun to, to get that linked. And um, uh, yeah, with that, I will turn it over to the panelists to wrap it up and uh, take us home to 1230. I'll just say thank you everyone for the opportunity to again work on this project and, um, and it was a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Maya. Um, Russ, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, John. No, I think it's been a very good discussion, and I I think it's brought up um, you know a lot of questions and and also just some thoughts about you know where this could go, and um, you know and, and I think you know we have the salmon treaty right, and it doesn't it's trying to reflect you know the the big changes that have happened to salmon you know over the last decades. And, and we are seeing, you know, um, that we're not seeing the amount that, that, that we have in the past. And many nations, First Nations or tribes, you know, aren't having the access that they once had. And so certainly, you know, the way we are, we are approaching this has to change. And, and that does mean, you know, that we need to be looking at how we take, incorporate those values to, with the things that are incorporated in this report into you know, agreements like the Salmon Treaty or, 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 or other initiatives. In Canada, you know, we're, we're still um, 
um, working on treaties, you know, between First Nations and, and Canada. Um, and, you know, fisheries is a big part of that, right? And, uh, you know, the same time we've been talking about, you know, access to fisheries, we're seeing, um, you know, depletion and, and conservation issues with salmon. So, so they're, you know, those, they're, those are the, the questions of the day that we need to be, uh, and we need to be looking at um, where we go in future to, to, to address them and find the solutions like Ron was mentioning. Oh, well, thanks everyone. Thank you, Chief Jones. Murray, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, probably leave the last word for my elder Ron. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I just wanted to express my appreciation for this work, the ability, again, to work with the tribes and the commission and the endowment funds to produce this. And of course, our, our friends at Earth Economics and where to from here is a really good question. I think there's lots of uh, opportunity for the nations and tribes to utilize this, you know, not only at the international scale, but bring it home, bring it home to the nations, bring it home to the tribes. And like I said, I think we need a little bit of time to debrief, um, see if we were going about it in the right depth direction. But, you know, just as importantly as I think it'd be good to hear from the commissioners, uh, the tech committees, um, the panels uh, to seek their views. And um, I think it's a really, really good opportunity and they can maybe contribute to, you know, providing guidance, whether or not we do another, uh, support another phase of this and do some more work. But again, we've got more work to do at the domestic level, similar to this, and uh, we'll look forward to that when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you, Murray. I, think, uh, I, I would just like to say thank you to the commissioners who allowed us to have uh, two hours of prime time um, to share this uh, indigenous perspective. <clears throat> so uh, um, uh, we deeply appreciate that. Um, and it's, it's hard. Uh, these meetings in January and February are packed with responsibilities. And, um, and uh, the, the fact that they gave us prime time here in the middle of the week, um, I think that we indigenous leaders are, are appreciative of it. I just wanna say I'm, I'm honored uh, uh, to uh, have been one of the advisors here along with Murray and, and Russ and Gord and McCoy, um, and then reaching out to all of our colleagues uh, throughout uh, the indigenous world of the Northwest. And, and I want to say uh, thank you to Maya and Will and uh, the uh, Earth Economic, uh, Ergonomics, uh, 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 I can't remember how you say your name, the title, but anyhow, you're, you guys have been consummate professionals, um, you know, and uh, you just did a fabulous job. So when we do decide what phase two um, is um, with regard to stepping off of this, uh, this, this foundation, um, uh, we'll probably be looking to you for assistance and and uh, making that that study or that work uh, successful as well. Thank you very much, Ron. And with that, I think we can say we're ready to close this morning session. Um, for me as executive secretary, this was really groundbreaking to see this sort of presentation and the interests across the PSC family and the fact that we got so many members of the public, the tribes and First Nations to join. I think this is a good model going forward for these sorts of uh, presentations. Um, I wish you all uh, a great rest of the day. And uh, as I said, keep an eye out for this recording on psc.org uh, and our YouTube channel. Um, thanks all and enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>